And let us discuss the major things that stand out for me for the Chronicles Volume 3. Ladies and gentlemen on YouTube, you might have missed my introduction on the Twitch, but as I mentioned before, on coming Monday, I'll be doing a full place video with a nice, you know, script to go attached to it and give you a... Currently, the plan is to just give you a very summarized story of what goes on in the Chronicles. And again, those things that really stand out for me, those things that seem to be changed, um, I will be covering those. Uh, no camera still? Nope. Haven't had a time to uh, invest into a new one. Right, so things that stand out for me. The Chronicles kicks it all off with a nice little summary of previous events. And of course they mention Sargeras forming the Legion, destroying the Titans, the War of the Ancients that plays out, the Horde invasion. All of that goes down and then they drop the interesting line that Sargeras enslaved the demons to do his dirty work. Whereas in the past it was described as he made a bargain with them, right? Either you serve me, or I'll kill you. Either you get lots of power, or you die. So, yeah, the, the enslaved part kind of comes from the um, Lofraxian storyline. He also mentioned, like, I was enslaved to Sargeras and the Legion. So I found it a nice touch. Then it flows into the Beyond the Dark Portal events, with Illyria and Trellian joining the Army of the Light. And they actually gave an explanation how some of the Draenei joined the Army of the Light. And basically it comes down to... Once the Editor escaped the planet with Velen, some of the Draenei stayed with Velen. And some of them found refuge within the Army of the Light. Then we have Ner'zhul, who's using his magic to turn Outland into uh, Outland as we know it today. Uh, and this pretty much created a uh, crossroads on Outland. Pretty much... You know, with all, with all the portals on the planet, it became a, a highway to hell. And it was a perfect staging ground for the Legion to use as, as for new invasions in different worlds. That is why MacFarren, for example, was sent out to Outland to conquer it. Uh, the orcs are then forced to join MacFarren. The sons of Lothar, Ketgar, uh, Kurdran, ooh, Dan of Trollbane. Uh, they try to slow them. They try to slow their progress. They don't really stand a chance against them, but they try to slow them. The Draenei are a little bit too weak to do anything at this point. As you might remember, they are hiding out in Zengamarsh. With, of course, the Broken. Those that inhaled the Red Mist. They're uh, not doing too well. We have the Arakoa that are hiding out in Akundun. And they are studying the Dark Forces there. And they're falling under its sway. Nerzu was then taken as he makes his portals and, and tries to go to the Promised Land. He's then taken by Kill Jaden. And um, in the past, we had this whole personal connection between Nerzu and Kiel Jaden. Nerzu was pretty much the staging ground for Kiel Jaden to corrupt the Hordes. They've, of course, changed that in the previous Chronicles to make that Gul'dan. So there's no longer such an intimate connection between Kiel Jaden and Nerzu. Which also gives the opportunity to not only have Kiel Jaden torture Nerzu and twist his mind, now we also have the Dreadlords joining on the fun. Tychondrius, Belnazar, Defarok, Melganus, and Varimafras. All of them worked on torturing Ner'zhul and uh, shattering his mind until eventually they turn him into the Lich King. This is still with the same motivation. Kill Jaden, you know, the, the Hordes, they had their infighting. He wanted an army that was single-minded that would not betray him. He worked on creating the Lich King. Now, unfortunately, what they planned to do was like shatter Ner'zhul entirely. Uh, but Ner'zhul would never forget what Kill Jaden had done to him. Right? And he would make him pay. So he goes to Northrend, um, they go into the Eastern Kingdoms, and then they're going to go into world domination. Pretty much how it all played out. Uh, they give details on how the Lich King was intrigued by the Vraiku and tried to create his own, eventually succeeding. Um, then we find out the effects of no more war between the Alliance and the Horde. We have the nations splitting as before. Uh, Orgrim, Doomhammer escape from the internment camps. Uh, Lafargi be amongst the orcs because their withdrawal of fell magic. Uh, the Warsaw and Gromash, of course, still refuse to surrender. The Blacktooth Grin are hiding out on Blackrock Mountain. The Dragomar are chilling in Grimbatol and they still have Alexstrasza under their control. And the Frostwolves, uh, Frost Clan, uh, Orgrim would sometimes visit them and they were still hiding out. Uh, let's see here. Then we have a Deathwing story, in which he still used the Horde to send his orcs to Draenor before it was turned to Outland. And what's interesting is that in previous Chronicles, they mentioned Deathwing already manipulating events between the Alliance um, as they were fighting their first and their second war. But I think they kind of made a mistake. In the previous Chronicles, they described him as this uh, Stormwind noble. 
But here they actually give him the name Devil Prestor. For those familiar with the, the story of Devil Prestor, he showed up after the events with the orcs and his backstory was, look, the dragons destroyed my, my kingdom, so you can't know where I'm from, let me in. And then he used his magic to manipulate the nobles, right? So here, right from the get-go, they call him Devil, Pre um, Devil Prestor and he was already part of manipulating the nobles. He even calls in Onyxia and Nefarian to join him, uh, where in the past he only did that during a point where um, he was sending his ex to Denor, right? Now it was already near the get-go, he was like, you know, Nefarian, Onyxia, Lady Katrana, Prestor, and whatever Nefarian called himself. The whole Prestor family, and uh, they joined the party and they manipulated events. The whole marriage between Deathwing and Kalia is not mentioned. Um, and the events of Day of the Dragon, they have been pretty much retconned to um, no longer line up with what we know. Like, a lot of events have changed. Ronin calls on his friends, Vrisa and the other guy. Um, while in the original story, they became friends over the storyline, right? So, the whole events of Days of the Dragon have been drastically changed, but the end result is still the same. Uh, Alexstrasza is liberated, Dragon Souls destroyed, Deathwing's plans are prevented, and everybody lives happily ever after. Uh, then, as you might remember, Cho'Gal, they did some massive changing to Corona's and Cho'Gal's storyline, even in their previous chronicles. And Cho'Gal was one of the guys that I was, like, most excited about when it comes to, like, oh, cool, what are they going to do with your storyline? What are they going to do with Corona's storyline? And surprisingly, very little. And yet, all the same, a lot. Basically, what happens is Corona sent out to hunt down Cho'Gal. She does some severe damage to his Twilight Hammer until Cho'Gal is like, you know what? She's gonna sit in the forest and await her to come to me. She does, they fight, and he enslaves her again. To which I'm like, why did you unenslave her to begin with? Like, you just make her a slave again. But yeah, uh, Chogol is able to get Corona back under his control, and in turn is able to use her to still do the events of Fetamore, as in interrupt the meeting between Alliance and the Hordes, and, you know, get everybody pissed at each other. That still happens. But the whole storyline with Madan, the prophecy with Kafoon, um, Aegwyn sacrificing her life to cleanse Atiesh, all of that is pretty much gone. So no more Madan. Na 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 na. So that, that's kind of good. Like, Madan was a shitty character anyways. But I was really curious to see how exactly they were going to solve that storyline, what we're going to do to fix it. Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot was actually fixed. Um, so yeah, we have Varian, Jaina, Arthas, Endwin. They're all growing up. Tiffin, her last name, is Alarian. I'm not even exactly sure if that was already revealed or not. But anyways, Tiffin's last name was Alarian before she became a Rin. Um, then we have the Lich King in Northrend. He's fighting with the Nerubians. And in the past, it was said that the Nerubians were actually immune to his plague, right? Now it just says that they were well defended, that the Nubarak was able to uh, prevent the plague from taking them. It doesn't mention them being immune anymore. Uh, but all the same, Lich King still wins, the Nerubians die, and the Nubarak is transformed into undead. Uh, Kelfizad, you know, listens to the whispers of Ner'zhul, pledges his allegiance to him, works on the plague. Thrall escapes from Durnholt, still pretty much the same. Um, yeah, he goes through the internment camps and he forms the new hordes. Katrana is still busy with uh, manipulating events. Greymane still builds his wall. Um, the Defiance Brotherhood storyline with rioting through the streets, with killing Tiffin. That all plays out pretty much the same. Um, Etrikaterian. Also still pretty much the same. Oh yeah. Interesting parts. Remember how Medivh came back in Warcraft 3 to warn the world on, you know... The Legion is coming. A lot more details have been given to that backstory line. Basically how they turned it is Aquin, his mother, she started seeing visions, dreams of her son. As his consciousness was drifting beyond the borders of reality, they called it. Um, you might remember Medivh being corrupted by Sargeras, Ketgar and Lothar and Corona confronted him. 
And uh, yeah, after that, no longer corrupted by Sargeras, consciousness was floating on the borders of reality. And his mother was like, hey, you're no longer corrupted. I'm going to use my magic to resurrect you. So she did. Medivh is brought back into the storyline. He uh, warns the world of the coming of the Legion. He unites everybody together. And then near the end, if you might remember from Warcraft 3, where he's like all vague and shit. And he's like, I'll take my place amongst the legends of the past. Here it says, let's see. I gotta scroll down a little bit now. Medivh, where did your description go, buddy? Oh yeah, here we go. From afar, Medivh surveyed the war-torn world and was relieved by what he saw. The Legion's invasion had failed. Azeroth was safe for now. Medivh knew that other threats, like the Lich King, yet lurked in the dark corners of the world. But he could not stop them. His powers were waning, and he felt that his time on the physical plane was coming to an end. And with that, the last Guardian of Azeroth vanished. So pretty much uh, what we expected in the past, that Aquin's magic was only for temporary, only for that purpose. His connection to the physical realm as she had brought him back was fading. He'd done a mission, but Eve is out. You might wonder, well, what about the vision that we saw in Ketgar, with Ketgar in, in the Karazhan revamp? Could be a memory of the tower, could simply be a ghost. We don't know exactly for sure. Um, let's see here. So we're scrolling back up again. So we know that the Lich King, he uh, still wanted to be free, right? So he worked on um, setting those events with Arthas in place. What I always thought to myself was that Ner'zhul set his eyes on Arthas way back when. If you remember his storyline from Rise of the... Sorry. Um, yeah, Arthas, Rise of the Lich King. Uh, he already, you know, had Invincible dying. There was a big motivation of Arthas going for this. The Holy Light failing him time and time again. Invincible is not even mentioned in his entirety of the storyline. Arthas is described more as a servant to the Lich King rather than a guy with his own motives, you know. Interesting fact is that Muradin and his expedition to Northrend looking for Frostmourne that was actually manipulated by the Lich King and the Dreadlords. And he put his eyes on Arthas like that's gonna be my champion. He convinced the Dreadlords to go with him. And he pushed Arthas to Frostmourne. We also have confirmation that the Dreadlords did indeed create the armor as well as Frostmourne. And they placed fail safes in, in, in the weapon itself that if it was used against the Dreadlords, it would not take their soul. Which is the reason why when Melganus was struck down, it was not actually sucked into the weapon. They made sure that it couldn't be wielded against them, right? they also the ones who uh, build up Icecrown Citadel around the Lich King. Uh, if there are any questions so far, by the way, feel free to ask them, right? Up to this point. Why make the armor as an embodiment of his spirit to contain him? Any news on Mankrik's wife? Nope. Uh, what do you think of the old gods influencing Quilbor, Centaurs, and Cobalt? I'm alright with it. Um, what's the story of Kel'Fuzad being at the Frozen Throne before Arthas gets the armor? That's old story, actually. That's just Kel'Fuzad listening to the Whispers of Ner'zhul and pledging his allegiance. To which we uh, see him return in Warcraft 3 and work on forging the Cult of the Damned. If you want to know that storyline, check out a short story on the WoW website. Is Aegwyn dead? So far in the Chronicles, not been decided. Uh, we were talking about this on Discord as well. And uh, Rain actually mentioned, like, you, we have storylines in Legion with uh, Meryl having Kafranatir inside of him, with Aegwin being a spirit. What's up with that? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, so far, um, so far she hasn't died yet in the Chronicles. Um, is Ner'zhul really dead? We'll get to that part. Since Madan in this comic is non canon, can Aegwin be put back into the game? Depends, but then again, we do see a spirit in the Tower of Karazhan. You could describe that as being an echo, of course, but that's up to Blizzard to decide what I want to do with that. Uh, does Chronicles ever speak about alternate Draenor? They do speak about alternate realities and time travel, not alternate Draenor in specific. Basically, the story in Volume 3 is um, Aftermath of Warcraft 2 all the way to the Cataclysm. End of Cataclysm. 
Uh, did the Chronicles give us a clarity if they defeated the old gods, if they're dead or not? Nope. The Chronicles describes it as defeated, not killed. So it's still up in the air um, if, if they're around or not. What do you think of Nazoth, Fear, and the Alliance Horde teams up? And do you think the higher chance of being the final battle for us of boss? Uh, I think it's, you know, it's pretty cool. And um, a final boss, uh, at least a part to play, for sure. Nerzul tells Arvis that the Lich King has seen the future, but why Nerzul haven't saw that Arvis will take control of him when he took the helm, and why he didn't saw that we players killed him? Uh, possibly for every oh, for every other prophecy story in WoW, uh, many different possibilities, many different storylines that could take place, and who's to say what prophecy is the truth? Is a volume 4 onward confirmed? Not yet. The Chronicles does end with a to be continued. But um, at the same time we have Kataku saying that it's the final one in the series. So I do not know. Uh, right, let's let's get back to the notes, shall we? Um, so Arthas takes out Malganus. Um, of course the Dreadlords were not happy. But the Lich King was like, you know, my bad. I wasn't fully in control of Arthas quite yet. Uh, Arthas returns home, slaughters everybody. Um, then we have the dwarves that wake up the Trogs and Uldaman. And what I found a very nice touch for our gnome brothers and sisters out there is that the gnomes pretty much sacrificed the gnome and the Gon for the sake of the alliance. Um, they were like, you know, we're dealing with a Trog invasion in our little city. We could use the help of the alliance, but at the same time, they are dealing with the Scourge. You know what? We'll deal with this ourselves. And they kind of sacrificed the city because of it. Ooh. So to make the plan of bringing Kel'Fuza back to life to help resurrect Archimonde, that's all pretty much the same. With uh, the major addition that they've actually given more storyline to the Skull of Gul'dan. In the past, all we really knew was that the Skull of Gul'dan was sent back with one of the troops from Drenor into Azeroth. And then it kind of vanished from the storyline. Now we find out that Tychondrius was actually there when Arthas and Kel'Fuza um, besieged Dalaran to get the Book of Medivh. And at that moment, they also took the Skull of Gul'dan. They added more power to the Skull. They brought it to what we now know as Felwood. They corrupted the land. And then Arthas pointed Illidan towards the Skull. Where in the past, Arthas was ordered to do so. Like there was a massive plan from the Lich King and Kel'Fuzad to, you know, have Illidan take care of the Dreadlords. So that it was easier for the Lich King to uh, break free. Now it was Arthas himself that came up with the plan. And, you know, he, he felt the skull. He was like, yo, Illidan, go get it, buddy. So Illidan takes the skull, take care of the demon, still gets banished. All the good stuff. Um, and like I said, they describe Arthas a lot more like a servant to the, uh, to the Lich King rather than a guy with his own ambitions. But nothing too major, in, in my opinion. Of course, Sylvanas is slain, raises the Banshee. They uh, take out Silvermoon. They actually made it a point to say, like, they go to quell the Nuss to go to the Sunwell, instead of they go to quell Fluss and then to the Sunwell. I thought that was a nice little detail. Um... Then we have Thrall and Jaina, that are manipulated by Medivh to meet up at Stone Talon Peak. And both sides have their own harsh journeys to follow. You might remember Thrall meeting up with Karen and the Tauren. Uh, Jaina, of course, has to go through the harsh lands. Interesting enough, the conversations between... Jaina, Arthas, and Medivh, as we saw in Warcraft 3. Like, Medivh showed up in the woods, warning Arthas, like, do not follow this path, young man, it will lead to ruin. And he showed up to Jaina in, in Strathfoam, like, look, you gotta take your people, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go! That never really described in the Chronicles, and it doesn't really seem to leave a lot of room to actually have that happen. So I don't think it actually happened. He just manipulated them into meeting up a Stone Talent to have the Alliance, or at least the remnants of the Alliance led by Jaina, and the Horde team up against the threat of the Legion. Ooh, let's see here what else we got. Fun note is that Tyrande actually saw Gromash and the Orcs and the humans as well walk through their forest. And she actually told the Sentinels to stay back. It was only after the Orcs started chopping down the woods that they was like, okay, we gotta attack now. So I thought that was a nice little detail. Of course, we have Manoroth getting Gromash to drink again. Um... Gromash then liberates his people from the blood curse. 
Troan then liberates Illidan. As I mentioned, Illidan goes after the Skull and gets banished again. Um, they blow up Nordersail, they defeat the uh, Archimonde and the Legion, and Medivh is happy. Then we go into Chapter 3, The Frozen Throne. Um, in which we have Kill Jaden. Be like, yeah, shit, this Lich King guy is getting a little bit powerful. The more minds he takes over, the more powerful he becomes. We gotta do something about that. Uh, Illidan taking up the Skull of Gul'dan made him a blip on the map for Kill Jaden. And Kill Jaden was like, I'll use you to take care of the Lich King. Illidan goes after the Eye of Sargeras. Uh, he used its power to strike out at the Lich King. Is interrupted. Now, Warcraft 3... We actually had named characters that confronted Illidan. We had Maiev, uh, who lied about Tyrande falling through the bridge. We had Kilfos that was like, well, Tyrande doesn't have to be dead. We had Melfurion pissed at Maiev. We had Illidan, who was like, oh, brother, I would never hurt Tyrande. She's my waifu. That, that, that isn't described. And it, it doesn't leave a lot of room to actually have that happen. So it seems like that's been cut out. It seems to be just a Blood Elf, Night Elf army disrupting Illidan's spell work. And he gets the hell out of there. Not sure how I feel about that. Either way, Mayev still follows Illidan um, to Outlands, where she tries to capture him. But her dumbass um, didn't realize that the, por the portal behind her actually shut, <laughs> so they had no way back home. <laughs> uh, Lady Vasha Kilfas show up, they save Illidan from his prison, they capture Mayev, and they reverse the roles. Uh, they become Lord of Outlands, just like before. Kill Jaina shows up, gives them another chance. Pretty much everything happens the same way as before. Um, with the addition that it seems to be, again, that Arthas is more a servant of the Lich King rather than somebody that's, like, willingly going into Ice Crown and be like, this is my destiny, this is what I've been waiting for, uh, to merge with Ner'zhul. Also, the events, as described in, in the Arthas novel, where, uh, they describe how Arthas stabbed Ner'zhul with Frostmourne and how he took control and, like, I am ready now. That's gone. He just used Ner'zhul's doubt and guilt about what he did to his people to put him in the corner. That's, uh, that's what just happened. And surely they don't retcon everything they did not mention in the Chronicles, correct? Um, my general rule of thumb is when they don't mention it and there is room for it to happen. For example, they don't mention the romance between Arthas and Jaina, right? Arthas being her first. But there is still plenty of room for that to happen. Whereas the moment where Illidan is confronted by Melfiore in Tyrande, Kilfus, and Maiev, that moment is described in detail as in the Alliance and the Blood Elf uh, armies uh, stop him. So there is not really wiggle room to actually put in there, oh yeah, but wait, Tyrande was down on the bridge. Illidan went and saved her. That That's not even there anymore. So that, that's my general rule of thumb. If there's room for it, I expect the additional information to be part of it. And it's just a uh, chronicle shortening it. But if it's not really there and it doesn't really fit anymore, then I think it's a retcon. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, then we have Sylvanas, of course. Sylvanas liberating herself from the Lich King's control. She goes out and she takes care of the Dreadlords. And back with the whole Ashbringer storyline. There was a lot of confusion about uh, the Dreadlords working working together with uh, Kelfuzad. Whereas Kelfuzad and the Lich King just betrayed the Dreadlords. They kind of cleaned it up. Not really neatly, but they kind of cleaned it up. Now the story is that Belnazar actually survived Sylvanas. He then infiltrates the Silver Hands, just like before. The Argent Dawn and the Scarlet Crusaders formed. Um, he has Renault betray his father, corrupting the Ashbringer. Um, and then Kelfuzata shows up and he's like, Hey, that's handy. That's Alexandros Mograine on the floor. And a corrupted Ashbringer. Score! It's, it's just kind of random that Kelfuzat picks up the corpse and turns Alexandros into a Death Knight. But at the same time, it's cleaner than it was in the past, right? Uh, so no allegiance is mentioned between Belnazar and Kelfuzad, and yet Kelfuzad still ends up with Mograine and a Corrupted Ashbringer. Um, then we have the events of the Sunwell that are unchanged with Avina Teague, you know, Darakan, that's, that's still the same. Uh, Garona at this point is still hunting Chogal, he then enslaves her. Um, 
Then we move on to Fendril Stackhelm, who wants to grow Teldrassil. And Malfurion is like, no. And the reason why Fendril wants to grow Teldrassil is because he's already under the influence of the Nightmare and Xavius. And they mentioned that he hopes to resurrect his son. Which, to my knowledge, is new. In my, in my mind, it was always... They use the image of his son to corrupt him. Not so much have him hoping to resurrect his son. That, that kind of seems to be new. Either way, he still strikes out a Malfurion. He still grows his little tree. He till, still takes control of the Scenarian Circle. Uh, while Malfurion is stuck in his coma. is stuck into his nightmare. Uh, founding of Durotar is pretty much the same. Except now, uh, they don't mention Rexar finding the Orc and getting his quest. It's now just... Um, Thrall's Horde seemed to be a force of pride and honor, and Rexar costly joined the orcs in a new home. And they even give credit to what Rexar did, like um, rally the ogres and, and the Tauren and the trolls. They give credit to that to Thrall instead of Rexar. Yet all the same, they still give Rexar the, the credit of killing Dalen Proudmore. Which I'm like, why? But whatever, um, that, that's what happened. Uh, interestingly enough, after the death of Dalen, Kal Tiras was actually pissed. At the Horde and they wanted vengeance. But the Allies was like, nah. We got the Forsaken to deal with. Or the Discourse to deal with. We're still a little bit reeling here. Let's just let it slide. But instead of getting pissed at the Alliance, they actually get pissed at Jaina. Which of course uh, flows into the events that we see in Battle for Azeroth. Um, with the whole song about Jaina and them being pissed at her. Which is, you know, a big motivation as to how the Alliance joins Kalteras. Um... Nome the Gone is pretty much the same. Sylvanas is looking for allies. I don't believe they ever mentioned her asking help from her former people. Help from the High Elves. But she does. Um, she sends emissaries to the Alliance. They don't even reach them. And then she also sends emissaries to the Horde. And I believe in the past there was only Hamul who was even remotely interested in the Forsaken joining the Horde. Now they're like, yeah, Thrall was on board and Karen was on board. Pretty much everybody was on board. On uh, getting Sylvanas into the hordes. Instead of being a lot more wary. Um, so yeah. Lord Run crumbled. Kal Tiras and Gilneas. They pretty much isolate themselves after these events. So Stormwind becomes the powerhouse. Uh, Onyxia splits Varian in two. His strong part. Just like before. Wanders the land a little bit. Gets enslaved to be a gladiator. Pretty much the same storyline. Whereas the weak willed king. is eventually placed back onto the throne. Uh, with Varian's origin story pretty much being the same. As in, uh, strong-willed Varian returns to Stormwind, confronts Onyxia, Onyxia kidnaps Anduin. They go to Onyxia's lair, they save Anduin, Varian is restored. Um, even up to the point where he goes to Fedamore and Garona strikes out. That has all been pretty much the same. Let's see here. Oh yeah! Oh! Probably one of my favorite parts. Let me take a sip before we go in here. Mm. Probably one of my favorite parts is what they've done with Moira. You might all remember Moira Bronzebeard, you know. Kidnapped by the Dark Island Wars. Fell in love with Dagran. Well, that kidnapping was an order of Ragnaros, the Dark Islands being enslaved by him. Dagran Faurusan even being empowered by Ragnaros. They kidnap Moira. They accidentally fall in love. You know, they have some good dwarven, uh, you know what, they have a little baby. And her father, he sends alliance troops in to save her. They kill her, uh, her daddy. Or sorry, her hubby, <laughs> even. And she's like, well, you know what? I don't like you very much, you killed the man I love. I'll carry on his work. So she goes on to try and liberate the Dark Island Dwarves. And the way she does that is, um... She is the one who draws in adventurers to come to Molten Core to take care of Ragnaros. And she's like, well, there's treasure, there's loot, you know, the, the time is right to strike. To which the Hydraxian Waterlords, they answer the call, they send in heroes into the Molten Core. And by taking care of Ragnaros, by sending him back to the Elemental Plane, she effectively liberates the Dark Island Dwarves. But she wasn't quite ready there. She was like, well, you know, the Dark Island Dwarves, we got like the bottom of the mountain. But well, we still have this true horde. We still have Nefarian. Let's try the same again. So she sends out word like, look, treasure, loot. Come take care of this, uh, this true horde for us. And of course, not mentioning that it was the Dark Island Wars. And the horde goes in. 
Ord goes in, take care of this true horde, take care of Nefarian. And Moira just sips back, kicks up her feet and is like, this is my mountain now. Oh, I'm such a fan of Moira now. I'm such a fan, man. Um, anything else interesting? There's the whole Desolate storyline to clean up. Um, Feralis, for some reason, the ogre in Feralis, the one in Dire Mall. For some reason, he was listening to the Nightmare. I, I, I don't really know why, uh, but he was. Uh, we take care of the elves and the demon inside that they were sucking on. That's pretty much the same. They, um, they pretty much given, you know... Kills to the factions, like the Alliance did this, the Horde did this, and we did this together. I believe there's a list on the WoW forums and on WoWhead. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, you can look it up there. I'll probably, once it's on the YouTube Monday, I'll uh, place a couple of links to said articles. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we take care of the Sunken Temple, we take care of Akar. What I really liked is that in the storyline of Akar, they actually use the um, tactics of the fight in the storyline itself. It was like, Akar was so greedy and sucking on blood that the players used to corrupt the blood to take him out. I love that. Really, really love that. Um, then we go into the whole Scarab Wall thing. Interestingly enough, Chogal and his Twilight members, they showed up at... Uh, AQ. And they wanted to set Cthoon free. They didn't even need to bring down the wall. They just did their magic and Cthoon was free. To which Cthoon rallied to the Silifit and the Akir and they got ready for that whole war that went down uh, went down there. Uh, Horde and Lions rallied the troops, Bolvar and Saurfang. Uh, Horde gets credit for AQ-20. Alliance gets credit for Cthoon and AQ-40. Um, for those that have been wondering, like, do we kill the old gods or are they still just defeated? The Chronicles... Clearly, time and time again, describes them as defeated, not killed. Um, so yeah, we go into Nocturamas. Like I said, the Ashbringer storyline is pretty much the same. What I found interesting is that Nosdormu sending heroes like Kresus, Ronin, and Broxigar back in time. That has been described as him dispatching the heroes rather than accidentally sending them back because he was trapped by the old gods. Just a, a minor touch. Um, then we go into Illidan dealing on Outlands. Basically what it comes down to is Illidan started to focus so much on taking care of the Legion. Training his demon hunters that he pretty much alienated his allies. Uh, only Lady Vush was still on his side. Her plans in the Zanga Marsh was literally just to get the troops water. So that they could drink and survive. Um, Kilfus... And the Blood Elves, they were dealing with their addiction. And, you know, Illidan had taught them how to drain certain things, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, so when Illidan started to train the Demon Hunters, Kilfus was like, Hey! Hey, Illidan! Illidan, listen! Could you teach me how to suck on that good fell? I've been told that the fell is the good shit! Mmm, I want some fell! So, um, Illidan taught Kilfus how to uh, suck on fell. And Fel is pretty much, you know, if if arcane magic is the good arcane, Fel is is crack. Fel is not good for you. So using the Fel magic that um, that pretty much played on his mind, as well, you know, his pride is um, failing his people. It didn't really help out much. What I did find very interesting is that when they describe how the uh, Blood Elves joined the Horde, if you go to the WoW story forums, the Blood Elf players always blame the Alliance, they always blame Ketaphos, whereas the Blood Elves themselves, in the storyline, they blame their own actions. They blame Kilfos joining with the Naga, as in souring the relations with the Alliance, so the Alliance was not even an option, they didn't even ask. They just went straight for the Horde. Anyways, Kilfos sucking on the good fell, made it vulnerable to kill Jaden. Kill Jaden started to uh, whisper sweet, sweet things to him. Like, uh, you know, if you, if you join Team Legion, I uh, I can hook you up with even better stuff. All you have to do is turn your back on Illidan. And over time, as Illidan was a dumbass and did not tell his allies what he was doing, um, Kilfus became distrustful of Illidan and he actually joined Team Kill Jaden. Uh, Akama, of course, was not happy about not getting the Black Temple back, so uh, he worked together with Mayev. Um, 
The whole reason why Tempest Keep showed up, that was because Velen was praying and Ketkar was reaching out into the Great Dark Beyond. They actually made contact with the Army of the Light, but the Army of the Light was a little bit busy. Uh, so they sent out Tempest Keep, they pretty much sent the B team. Uh, to which Velen takes the Exodar and, and goes out to get Team Azeroth into the fight. Uh, and Adal goes to Shefrev to unite the people of Outlands, ready to make a resistance against Illidan and the Legion. Um, funny enough, Kil'jaeden was actually aware of what Velen was doing, and he was perfectly fine with it. He figured that he could use Azeroth to uh, take care of the Illidan problem for him. And that's exactly what we did. Um, Kil'jaeden's demons reopened the Dark Portal. We were lured into the Dark Portal. We noticed that Illidan, um, you know, wasn't doing the greatest things. It was not exactly like he was explaining his actions or motives. So we took care of business, we took care of McFarren, we took care of Vush, we took care of Illidan. Um, Blood Elves also discovered that Kilfus had joined Team Legion. So we took care of Kilfus and... Um, yeah, that pretty much happened. Alliance is given, given credit for uh, the Sunwell. Whereas the Offensive is given, given credit for killing Kilfus a second time. Um... Not entirely surprising, I suppose. Like, Velen did reignite the Sunwell. But I don't really see why they had to give that one to one single faction. As in Alliance and Horde both worked on getting the Sunwell back. But whatever! Whatever! It's given to the Alliance. Which then takes us into... The Wrath of the Lich King periods. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Mm. Oh yeah, side note, there is absolutely no mention of Zeta at all. She could still be a thing, but quite literally there's no Zeta mentioned. And as Illidan dies, in-game we saw the whole cinematic where he was like, Tyrande. In the Chronicles, he does not mention Tyrande. In the Chronicles, he uh, his last thoughts go back to Mayev. How the hunter is nothing without the hunt. And that just makes my heart very happy, since it, you know, reinforcement reinforces my ship between Mayev and Illidan. I was very happy about that. Um, did they f fix Mayev's story? They didn't actually mention Mayev as far as I recall when it comes to the whole High Elves joining uh, Darnassus. Now that you mention it... Um yeah, Zeta is mentioned with Illyria and Trellian. I was I was talking about the Illidan storyline. Reynek, do you remember actually reading about the whole Mayev going nuts storyline? I do not, now that I think about it. So, yeah, we take care of the Burning Crusades. Um, Zulaman takes place, nothing much happens there. Uh, we have the whole Nether Dragon storyline with Malagos regaining a sliver of his sanity. That's all pretty similar. Then we have an interesting tidbit. Did you know that once upon a time, Cho'Gal traveled to Northrend, to Ulduar, to weaken Yaxaran's bonds? I bet you didn't, because that's new. But he did, and this then in turn allowed Yaxaran to take full control over Ulduar. Um, and then Cho'Gal goes out to drive a wedge between the Alliance and the Hordes, to which he sends out Garona to uh, interrupt the meeting between the Alliance and the Horde. Mm -hmm. How did he do that? Magic. Simply magic. Do you want me to read it out in full detail? Hang on. Hang on. I'll tell you how he did it. Ha ha ha. Docho Gaul was pleased by the Twilight's Hammer Cult's burgeoning strength. He remained troubled by Cthulhu's fall. He had never expected mortals to have power to feed an old god. Nonetheless, Cho'Gal did not abandon his quest to initiate the Hour of Twilight. While the Horde and Alliance were occupied in Outland, Cho'Gal visited Northrend and infiltrated Ulduar, the keeper up prison of the old god Yaxaran. Yaxaran, uh, sorry, he slipped into the depths of the fortress, and his defenders did nothing to stop him. Yaxaran clouded the minds of Loken and the other ancient keepers, concealing Cho'gal's presence. Yaxaran had long ago enthralled the keepers who guarded Ulduar, but the entity's grasp from this was tenuous. Convincing them to directly help the old god had proved fruitless in the past, but there would be no such trouble with Cho'gal. 
the two-headed ogre willingly chipped away at Yaksharan's enchanted bonds. He could not break them, but he managed to weaken the chains. That was enough to increase Yaksharan's influence tenfold. The old god's control over the keepers became as strong as iron. So he chipped away at it. That's how he did it. He chipped away at it. Magic. Um, let's see here. So Jogal goes to Urwar. Aegwain joins Jaina. Uh, Fenimore, same history. Same fate with Corona. Um, Malagos wakes up and he's like, hey, you're uh, abusing magic. And like I mentioned, the whole uh, motivation between Arthas and Ner'zhul stabbing in Frostmourne has changed. DK starting area is the same. Horde gets Body and Tundra. Alliance gets Howling Fjords. Um, when we defeated Kel'Fuzad, it said... Um, rumored to be lost in the Shadowlands, the realm of the dead. Who is rumoring that? We do not know. Um, but that is what is rumored to happen to have happened with Kel'Fuzad. Um... Interestingly enough, the way that they described it, it almost seemed like Dalaran did not teleport to Northrend until after the fall of Naxxramas. Which then leads into the Nexus War, the death of Malagos, um, all the good stuff. Rothgate, of course, with Dranos and Bolvar. What's interesting, what's interesting about the Rothgate is, for those that read the storyline, you might remember that Sylvanas actually had her troops ordered... To make a plague that would not only kill the dead, but also the living. But she just flat out lies to the Alliance and the Horde. Like, Jaina sits down with Sylvanas to talk about things. And she just lies. Like, oh yeah, that wasn't me. That was Putris and Varimafras. Curse them. Damn them. But then in the uh, minor description, it just says that she still was responsible for creating this plague. She does not want to own up to it. Uh, so Alliance and the Horde going into the battle for the Undercity. They reclaim the city. Varian is like, rawr, rawr, rawr. And declares war for all. To which Yaxaran wakes up. We go into Uruar. We take care of business there. Elglon is summoned. You might remember Elglon wanted to use the device in Ulrum. To purge all life from Azeroth. That is still the same. Except the device also had the power to... Um, restart life. If I remember correctly. So not only did it destroy. It also gave uh, birth to a new generation. But of course we prevented those things from happening. Tyrion has his little Argent tournament. We go into Ice Crown, and in his dying moments, Arthas felt the corruption of the Frozen Throne fading from him, and he was faced with the enormity of his crimes. He slipped into death, into a cold and unforgiving afterlife of darkness. No, so sad. So Bolvar becomes the Lich King. There must always be a Lich King to keep him in check. And uh, if you've read Sylvanas' a short story, you might remember that Sylvanas ended up in Hell. And that's been a big part of her motivation to, you know, make the bargain with the Valkyr and stay the hell out of hell. <laughs> now it seemed to be more a description of, um, she saw a vision of the future where her forsaken were squandered. And the Chronicles almost makes it seem like that has been a motivation to come back. Not so much to stay out of hell, but to actually protect her forsaken, which was a little bit odd to me. But there you go. Um... So yeah, the deal with the Emerald Nightmare with Xavius. Uh, what's interesting is that in the novel Stormrage, they mention banishing the Nightmare to the Rift of All, and then they're like, well, we'll have to take care of this later on. Whereas Xavius, both his tree form in the physical realm and his spirit form in the Nightmare, were taken care of. Now they've made it that Xavius' spirit was also locked away in the Rift of All, which of course leaves the book open for him to return in Legion. Uh, then we go into the Cataclysm, and interestingly enough, the Cataclysm uh, is probably the most unchanged part of the entire Chronicles, of the entire storyline. Pretty much the Cataclysm is the Cataclysm as we saw it in-game. Uh, of course, Nazoth behind it all, feeding Deathwing his power. Um, one massive detail that I saw changed is, if you remember the Shattering... Where there was a peaceful meeting between Alliance and Horde Druids. And that was attacked by the Orcs. And people believed it was an Order of Garrosh. But it was actually the Twilight Hammer. Yeah, that attack is not even mentioned. Instead, the motivation for Karen to challenge Garrosh to Makura was simply Garrosh going for war. 
and Karen did not agree with that. And then the whole betrayal plays out. Uh, Magava poisons Gorhal, and Karen is struck down. So, Deathwing, Chogol, the Twilight Hammer, the Elemental Lords, blah, blah, blah. We fight all across the world. Uh, we prevent the plans from the Zoff. And this was their one opportunity to actually make sense out of the whole time travel bullshit. Um, you know, if you might remember Nosdormu and, and being corrupted and, and all that good stuff. You might think, well, maybe, just maybe, they'll actually explain more or, you know, fix it. Yeah, no, it's just the way it happens. Uh, they do make a mention of the whole Nordrasil ritual. Uh, a lot of people that play during the Cataclysm, they might remember the whole wedding questline with Fro. And the original start of that questline was to actually join the Aspects in healing Nordrasil. Which was then interrupted. Fro was split into the four elements. They had a marriage and they never explained if Nordrasil was healed or not. If the whole origin of the mission actually played out. Now we know that the Aspects did indeed heal Nordrasil uh, after those events. Uh, so yeah, the end of the Cataclysm. The the final note really that, that stood out is that instead of uh, the Aspects losing their immortality and a vast chunk of their power, in the Chronicles it just describes it as losing a vast chunk of their power. It doesn't exactly mention their immortality. Could still be a thing. I, I do not know. It could just be that they didn't mention it in the Chronicles, but there it is. And those are the major things that stood out for the Chronicles for me. Like I said, for Monday I'll make a nice, clean, not half a bottle of rosé in my gut kind of video. But I really wanted to uh, point out some of the highlights. So are there any questions, everybody? Is there anything you want to know? What do I think about giving credit to each raid that was cleared out? I don't mind it. I, um... Like, the Sunwell give it to the Alliance, I find that a bit odd. But overall... I don't mind it. Is Azora a servant of Nazoth? Yes. Yes, she is. You think the book is written in terms of being a book in universe or just a lore bible? I do not understand that question. Uh, Gilneas. Gilneas is pretty much the same, Kaji. Like, quite literally, there's nothing changed to the Gilneas storyline. Trogal visiting Northrend basically take place of Trogal trying to back Cthulhu from the comics. Uh, no, he still goes to Ankiraj. He still tries to break out Kafoon. And then he just goes to Northrend. Was there Fendral in the book? Yes. Fendral, also pretty similar, with the exception of his trying to resurrect his son. But yeah. Which do I think was the best chronicle? Uh, first one. <laughs> Mainly because that, you know, blew it all open. So does it mean Ysera isn't dead? Ysera died in Legion. The chronicle takes place up to the end of Cataclysm. Um, does it say anything about Mankinik's wife? Nope. Have they cleared up some stuff regarding Jared's leading role in the current Watch of Darnassus? Nope. Not as far as I could tell, anyways. What was Northern Seal healed from? Uh, the destruction of Archmond, I believe. And then also Ragnaros and the fire elementals during the Cataclysm. Mm, are Blood Elves now purified from the fell? Uh, it appears so. Or at least it, it's a possibility for the future. Did my music die? No, it did not. It just became very quiet. All right. Is Anduin secretly his relationship with Sylvanas? Nope. Where is Fral? Chilling with his family. Uh, let's let's make the questions about the Chronicles, shall we, everybody? Um... Yeah, pretty much Drakon, pretty much. Like, they didn't even mention the whole, this was our destiny. They just mentioned it in the sense of, they had to give up the power to stop Deathwing. Yeah. Um, in the blood says, when the gate of Gilneas was closed, exactly? Ooh, that is a good question. Let me look it up. I didn't actually make a note out of it, because it was just, you know... It all just floats so naturally. Um, the Alliance Splinters. and they, Oh, sorry. Uh, Thrall learns the new ways of Shamanism of Drekfar. Um, he goes out to liberate the rest of his people. To which the Alliance Splinters. And they're like, look at these internment camps. We gave so much money to it and it didn't even work. And then Gilneas... Uh, follows the High Elves' lead into leaving the Alliance and building their wall. Mm. 
Yeah, apparently so, Tanks. I read that as well. The Titans never informed them about the World Soul, yeah. Um... Are they gonna make a fourth Chronicle? The Chronicle does end with To Be Continued, but it could also be just To Be Continued in the, in the game. Maybe. Uh, but let's keep in mind that this one plays out from War End of Warcraft 2 all the way to Cataclysm. So they only have uh, Mop, Draenor, and Legion to work with right now. So, yeah. Uh, do you think there's a chance for KT to return? Yes. Did they make clear what Arfs did to Ner'zhul? Yes. Do you want me to read out? It's It's quite interesting. You want me to read it out? I'll read it out for you, everybody. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> I hope you're ready for this. Because it is uh, quite different. Um... When Arvs had dawned on the armor of the Lich King, he had feared that the entity might consume his mind in the process. That had not happened. Arvs' personality had remained intact, and he had, ascended to even, he had ascended to even greater power, a power he wielded alongside of Ner'zhul. Both of the spirits coexisted within the same physical body. Over time, Arvs had concluded that sharing the Lich King's might with Ner'zhul would only lead to disagreements, confusion and disorder. Only a single mind could wield this power with precision and harness its true potential. Arvis had tried to overwhelm the orc spirits, and Ner'zhul was nearly destroyed. Arvis is set on the frozen throne, satisfied that he was completely in control of the Lich King's strength, the sole ruler of the Scourge. After a few years, he realized that he was wrong. Deep within his mind, he could feel Ner'zhul struggling to wake up. The two beings went to war for permanent control of the Lich King's power. Ner'zhul had the initial advantage, for he had lived with this power far longer than Arvis had. But Arvis was prideful, stubborn and determined. He found the single weakness in Ner'zhul's soul, the lingering guilt over his unwilling role in enslaving the orc race to the Burning Legion. Arthas had long since buried his own guilt, the murder of his father, the innocence he had slaughtered, and all the rest of his betrayals. He no longer felt an ounce of sorrow about any of it. Through force of will, Arthas clawed his way through the orc's mental wounds and tore apart Ner'zhul's mind. As the Lich King's body sat motionless on the frozen throne, Arthas took complete control. The process was agonizing for Ner'zhul. Not only did Arthas drown him in his guilt, but he deliberately snapped the bonds of sanity, causing the orcs to spiral further and further into despair. Uh, when the final battle was through, nothing remained of Ner'zhul but a wail of sorrows in the back of the Lich King's consciousness. Arthas found it easy to ignore. And there you go! That's what happened to uh, a good old Ner'zhul right there. Sylvana's suicide is indeed mentioned, yes. Um, is Nazoth mentioned? Yes. About Aegwin, apparently in the comics she served as Janus Chamberlain and died. Correct, that is not what happened in the Chronicles. Did the Chronicles live up to your expectations? Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, Chogal was a little bit odd. But I especially liked the way that they described us as heroes and, and give a ruling on the events of the Cataclysm, of a uh, classic. Yeah, I quite like it. Uh, my F will appear in Battle for Azeroth. I cannot predict the future. What is your overall thoughts on the books? Uh, I would highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in the lore. And what are your thoughts on the changes made? Nothing too major, in my opinion. I uh, I quite liked it. What would I rate it? A yeah, solid 8, sure. If definitely regretted anything what he did, nope. Mm, Sylvanas kind of being a good person. Uh, I wouldn't call that. <laughs> Anything related to Mop? Nope. It pretty much cut off when uh, they took care of Deathwing. That's it. Ooh, does it have the Stone Teller Mountain storyline for the Horde and Chronicles? If you mean Warcraft 3, a little bit. It explains how they travel there. Blood Elves were rejected by the Alliance before they were accepted by the Alliance. Uh, no, the Blood Elves are no longer rejected by the Alliance. The Blood Elves didn't even bother because they knew that they soured the relationships by uh, teaming up with Vush. So they didn't even bother. Ha ha. <laughs> I wonder how the forums are going to react to that. I've seen so many posts of Blood Elves like, But the Alliance! But the Alliance! And now it's the Blood Elves didn't even try. Lol. I mean, Gettafos is still a racist asshole. Don't get me wrong, but lol. Lol. 
What about Childorf? There's no mention of that. I still wonder if Akelikos lost all of his aspect powers. I mean, you'll have to ask Blizzard that one, maybe. So, if what is the, uh, War of the Ancient Trilogy played out after, that means Brox was alive during AQ. Indeed, thanks. We also mentioned that during the Discord, yeah. It's a little bit awkward. Although, keep in mind that even though it's described in that way, I could not find a clear ruling on the time period. It might just be that it decided that description to put it after those events, right? Uh, what would I say is the worst and the best change to the lore in the book? Ooh, um, I'd say the worst change is making Arthas more of an obedient servant rather than the actual interesting character that he was. Maybe Lady Vush. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I completely forgot to tell about that. Uh, remember Lady Vush in the Naga joining up with Illidan during Warcraft 3? And they never really explained why that happened. Um, now it turns out that Illidan... He had only heard rumors of the highborn fate. I don't know where he heard these rumors. Apparently in jail or something like that. Uh, and he used his magic to reach out to them. And they replied, Lady Vash and the Naga. Not because of their history with him. Not because of his power. But simply because the old gods willed it. And that was kind of sad. I was like, that was not needed. There, there was more potential there. Uh, and the best change, in my opinion, is how they clean up, like, classic storytelling. I really like that. The question is, who made the spaceships? Wasn't that the Naru, though? Weren't they, like, Naru spaceships? I'm pretty sure that that's what, what was it. Covers the end of the Cataclysm. Does it cover Madan's storyline? Madan has been cut out of the storyline ever since Chronicle Volume 2, maybe. Is there gonna be more books? Yes. Uh, Before the Storm is the next novel by Christy Golden. I believe the um, setup or the release date is going to be June. Why didn't Savannah's help push the orcs back in the second war? She did. She defended Quelphalus. Does Gatos get mentioned? Yep. Any mention about Ralph? Yeah. Can the dragons have kids again? I do not know. Like it only says that they lost a portion of their power. It doesn't mean about it doesn't mention their uh, reproduction abilities, nor their immortality. Which volume do I think is the best art? Ooh, all of them knocked it out of the park, though. Should have been Vash still had a thing for him, right? But it makes sense. Yeah, it does, and it doesn't. Like, it makes sense that the Naga are working for the old gods, but there could have been so much more. In the War of the Ancient Trilogy, there was actually a little bit of a flirtation between Vash and Illidan. They could have played upon that. There was the Naga going for water in the Zengamars. They could have gone for, like, making a brand new Well of Eternity. And they didn't, you know. Mm, any new info about Volvar? Not really. Besides him keeping control and learning that the Valkyrs stepping away from him, you know, was a lesson. Like, I, I can't let anybody else do that because I need to keep these under control. Uh, so yeah. Did they say anything about the goblins? Nothing new. No, just that Gallywix was the best to stay on as the leader because he had connections and charisma and the way how they left Kazan and all that. What is the order of all the books? I have a forum post on that. I'm sure that if you Google reading order, wow, you'll you'll find it. Any mention of Valera Sanguinar? Ooh, um... I do not recall. I don't think so, actually. It's gonna, I'm gonna make that one my last question, then we'll go into the Battle for Azeroth uh, questing experience, yeah? She's not mentioned here in detail. They did mention that um, Varian's stronger side did the whole arena thing, so I assume that she's still part of that storyline. But I do not recall her being mentioned. So yes, ladies and gentlemen on the Twitch, as well as ladies and gentlemen on, ladies and gentlemen on the YouTube, I'm going to call this one... This quick overview of, of the things in the Chronicles that stood out for me. I'm going to call it a day. Like I said, coming Monday, I'll make a more, you know, scripted, cleaner version of this. Where we'll cover the um, majority of the storyline. You know, give a, a quick overview of what went down. And then speak about the major things that stood out for me. That will be for Monday though. For now, thank you very much for watching everybody. And until next time guys. See ya!